Welcome everybody. We will be getting started momentarily. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. We're about to get started with today's webinar. Today's webinar is the $425 million Bitcoin bet. Today, we have our special guest, Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy. In addition, we have Kraken's growth lead, Dan Held, who will be hosting today. Please take it away, Dan. Thanks for getting us started, Patrick. And uh, thank you for everyone tuning in. We're super thrilled to have you today. We've got Michael Saylor. I think a lot of people have heard about his $425 million purchase of Bitcoin with his company's treasury. I, I think it's hard to find a bigger bull than Michael. So we're super excited to dig in with him and understand a little bit more around how he found Bitcoin, uh, what makes him bullish about Bitcoin. And uh, I think him and I are gonna have a fun back and forth on you know, getting a little bit out there. Maybe we'll talk about Bitcoin in space and uh, the future of Bitcoin over hundreds of years. So, Michael, thanks for joining us. Um, to kick off, you know, we wrote the title of this webinar, the $425 million bet, but we didn't know that you bought $200 million with your own personal, uh, your own personal funds as well. Did you make that purchase at the same time you made the purchase with your company or how did that work? Um. Well, as you know, uh, earlier this year, I, I started down the rabbit hole path. And um, I would say during April and May, I went through my educational process. And I came to a conclusion that uh, Bitcoin was a good idea, right, uh, as a store of value. I think that I, I think that the challenge everybody is dealing with is, is in um, a macroeconomic environment of aggressive monetary expansion, uh, what's the best store of value? Is it, is it equity? Is it bonds? Is it precious metals? Is it something else? And I discovered the something else being Bitcoin. And uh, once I discovered it, 
I decided that uh, that was a, a good idea, so I bought it. <laughs> and uh, you have to distinguish between uh, the decision-making process of an individual and the decision-making process of a company. So, and the decision-making process of a private company versus a public company. As an individual, for me to get to the point where I, I had uh, a belief and a conviction and made a decision, it's a, a dialogue with myself and, and my closest advisors, but it's a, it's a fairly tight group. So that comes quickly. And I don't have any fiduciary responsibilities or reporting responsibilities when I'm acting on my own behalf. So that's straightforward. If I ran a private company, then of course, the dialogue would be a bit more more uh, extensive. You might have private investors, you might have a private CFO, you might have private creditors. And so between the investors and the creditors and your management team, it would take a bit longer. If you run a public company, then you have to, you have to work through this issue of, is it the right thing for the public company? And then you have to work through building consensus with the officers of the company, the directors of the company. And then you have to think through your regulatory responsibilities, the legal, the accounting issues. And then you have to think through the relationships with your outside shareholders. If you had a, if you had a private company, you might have outside shareholders, but you might have four of them and you could contact them all directly. When you're a public company, you have lots of outside shareholders and you can't simply pick up the phone and call them all directly. So, so uh, the process of the company buying Bitcoin was more extensive, uh, more regimented, uh, more methodic by necessity than the process of me buying it privately. So, the, I mean, the way this worked is I came to the con conclusion, had a conviction then I, I took the idea to the, the public company and I, I uh, told them exactly what I had done because I think it's very important from a point of view of, um, of transparency and in order to avoid a conflict of interest for them to know that I had actually made that investment. So, so they knew, but even if they did know, there's no way a public company is going to move as fast as a single individual. So I did it first. The company, and but there's no guarantee the company would do it at all, right? I, I, like I didn't know the company would make the decision until we made the decision. It could have been, we could have not for any number of reasons. In fact, the first Bitcoin investment of MicroStrategy, it wasn't 425 million. It was a $250 million investment coupled with a $250 million stock tender offer. <clears throat> so what we did was, uh, was offer to buy back $250 million worth of our shares at a premium. And we bought that and we, the Bitcoin. And we didn't do either of those two, two things until after we had already disclosed that we were contemplating those two things and let that settle in the market. So, so the process of a public company is, is much more uh, intricate than a private individual. And it, in essence, it became three steps, right? I, I made my decision. Right? I make my decision. The company decides whether it will, it will make a decision. Then the company made a decision to buy 250 million worth of Bitcoin. Then we let the shareholders make their decision as to whether or not they were going to sell their shares back to us in the tender offer or not. Then the tender offer expired we had extra money. Then we disclosed to the shareholders that we might buy more Bitcoin. Then we bought more Bitcoin. And so it's almost like a four, five, six step, multi-step process in order to arrive where we are today. And, and at each step, I mean, I think the real key issue is, are you transparent and respectful of all, of all constituencies? Have you disclosed to all constituencies? Because the goal along the entire way is don't surprise anybody, right? The, the company was not surprised that I own the Bitcoin. They knew it, right? The shareholders were not surprised that we were considering this. <clears throat> they knew it. 
after we did it, the shareholders were given, a, given the ability to tender their shares at a profit, at a premium and exit if they didn't feel comfortable with it. Then they knew we'd buy more, then we bought more. And so that's how that evolves and, and uh, hopefully that helps. <laughs> Yeah, I think everyone was incredibly blown away by how bullish your original purchase was with your company. And then the personal bet on it as well is really big. Um, you know, I think some people noted that it might be the one of the largest purchases of Bitcoin at that price from an individual. Because a lot of the early Bitcoiners that I know bought Bitcoin when it was a dollar or a penny. And so they might have 10,000 Bitcoin, but they bought it. The cost basis was much lower. So um, I think that was that was really shocking to me. I think was just kind of blown away by how. Well, you know, I, I wish I'd figured it out at a at a dollar or at ten dollars or at a hundred and eleven dollars <laughs> or at a thousand dollars, but I have this motto: better late than never. Hey, I still think we're very early. I think you're in the same sort of mindset. In fact, Michael, how early do you think we are? Like on the stage of Bitcoin's evolution, where are we on that adoption curve? Because you've been around, uh, you've run MicroStrategy for such a long time and you've seen different innovation cycles play out. Where are we on that curve? Look, I think this is a classic paradigm shift as Thomas Kuhn would say in the structure of scientific revolutions. And, and uh, yeah, you can see them with the automobile, with, with a mobile phone, with airlines, with, with uh, crude oil. Um, up until the paradigm shift starts, you could go hundred, you know, people tried to create airplanes that flew for hundreds of years. Leonardo da Vinci was thinking about it. And up until 1902, every learned person in the universe could give you a million reasons why airplanes will never work. And in 1903, a couple of bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, not the people you would think would invent the airplane, they figured it out, bicycle mechanics. And from 1903, uh, you know, from, look, from, what is it, uh, Daedalus tried to fly too close to the sun, or Icarus, Icarus, <laughs> Icarus crashes and burns. Thousands of years people have been trying and failing. In 1903, it sort of works. By 1969, we're on the moon. And so the S curve, it, it, it kicks up, it it's accelerates, and... Um, with all these technologies, I think um, the time to buy them is when they're big enough that it's obvious they work and they've got massive momentum, but when 99% of the people on the street don't understand them. And in this particular case, I, I say it's, it's reasonable. 99.9% .9 of all the assets in the world are in alt assets. $250 trillion in, in bonds, stock, real estate, precious metals, derivatives, $250 billion in Bitcoin, 0.1%, 10 basis points. I don't think that means that 99.9% .9 of the people don't know, but maybe 99% don't really understand it. So on one hand, we know we're early because it's the solution to $250 trillion worth of a problem. <laughs> the problem is in, you know, in a, an aggressively expanding monetary environment where fiat currency is not going to hold its value, i.e. where the, if I'm sucking 10 or 15% of the energy out of a unit of currency every year, and you know, we, it depends upon which, which unit of currency, right? In Argentina or Turkey, we're losing more than 10% of energy a year. In the US, we could debate whether it's 10 or whether it's 15. If you looked at the M2 monetary supply, right, it maybe it was 5% expansion for 10 years, and now it looks like it's 20% this year. And what's your forecast for next year, right? In an environment where you're expanding the monetary supply, you're sucking the energy out of the unit of currency, all the equities, all the bonds, have to be valued as the discounted value of the cash flows. And so the discount rate is equal to the risk-free discount rate seems like it's the monetary expansion rate. That, and so if the, if the money supply is expanding by 10%, the discount rate's got to be 10%, which means that, that the, under, the fundamental underpinnings of a bond based on its cash flows have to be discounted by 10% a year. 
and uh, and equity has to be the same way. So everybody in the world is, you know, if you've got real estate, you're valuing the real estate based upon the discounted cash flows of the rents. And if you've got a bond, you're valuing the bond based upon the sum of the discounted cash flows of the bond. And if you've got a stock, you're valuing based on the sum of the discounted values of the stock and the fiat currency in, in the system where the, the entity is doing business, whatever that might be. So everybody's holding those assets. And in a world where the fiat currencies are expanding at 0% a year, there's no problem. Right, the, the underpinning, if the US dollar was expanding at 0% a year, the underpinning of the currency, the base currency layer is stable. You have hard money, no one's got a problem. And mm. as, as we expand it, everybody's got a problem. And now you've got a solution. And 99% of the people don't understand the solution. Ergo, we're very early in the S curve, but we're 250 billion into it, which means that when the fire was, when we were at a billion dollars, it could have been snuffed out. I mean, I could, you know, you could figure out what could have happened. The IRS could have given you a hostile tax treatment. The, uh, you know, the government could have made it illegal to own it. Bank, you know, you could go through a parade of, of things. The, the forks could have forked, 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 forked again. You know, hackers could have found a way to hack the blockchain and, and drain off the value. You know, each of those things could have been debilitating to its growth. It's, it's just like starting a fire. It's like you can snuff out the flame, but once it's a forest fire, not so easy to snuff it out, right? So I think that we've got a forest fire. Way. We have a fire in cyberspace. It is raging with $250 billion worth of monetary energy. I think it's too big to stop right now, or at least let's just say it, it's, it's conceivable to stop the forest fire, but it's a lot harder to stop the forest fire than it is to put out the campfire. It was a campfire when it was a dollar. <laughs> totally. Michael, there's a lot of things to unpack here that I want to touch on. One is I love that you, you know, when you get into talking about like discounting cash flows and looking at how the, uh, how the Fed and other central banks influence how investments are made. It's essentially like the, it's essentially a measuring stick and they, they keep changing that constantly, which makes an investor like yourself or a businessman look at like, how do I measure different investments? And if they distort that underlying measurement of the successful allocation of capital, then that's a, you know, that makes running a business super hard because then you don't know what, you, what return you're getting because what, you know, are you beating inflation? Are you beating this distortion in the economy? Yeah, it's really a question of your relative framework, right? If, if you take as a given that, that dollars are constant and valuable, then of course you would never trade your dollars for anything that had volatility because you would see that as risky. But if you take as a given that the dollar is going to lose 10% of its value every year, then it changes your frame of reference. I think that a metaphor, which is very useful here, or a model that's very useful, is um, is the model of adiabatic laps, or in thermodynamics, there's something called an adiabatic system. So if I'm at sea level, and I've got constant pressure, I've got constant oxygen, and uh, and I've got constant energy. Energy is heat. As I suck the energy out of a system, the temperature falls. So if I take you up a thousand feet, you lose three degrees Fahrenheit. If I take you up 10,000 feet, you lose 30 degrees Fahrenheit. That's why in, you know, in Aspen or in the mountains, you've got this cool climate in the summer. It's all, it's all quite pleasant if it's Aspen in the summer. On the other hand, when I take you up 50,000 feet, you lose 150 degrees Fahrenheit now you go from 70 degrees above, you know, 70 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 80 below, but that's not the only problem. The, I mean, the other obvious problem is that uh, as the pressure falls, oxygen falls out of the solution. And, uh, you know, when you go to what, 9,000 feet, you've lost 30% of the oxygen. When you get to the top of Mount Everest, you've lost 80% of the oxygen. If I kick you out of an airplane at 50,000 feet, you know, if you don't suffocate to death, you'll freeze to death. One, you know, you, you, you choose your poison. So if I, if I keep 
expanding the monetary supply. It's the same thing as if I created a room at 70 degrees with oxygen and I kept expanding the room by 10%, I'm creating an adiabatic lapse and, you know, and I'm simultaneously freezing you and suffocating you. And so the real dilemma here is that in a, in a fiat system with, with a monetary supply that's expanding at a rapid rate, you're freezing and suffocating everybody doing business in the currency. It's just a question of how fast am I, am I taking? It's like marching a bunch of Boy Scouts to the top of Mount Everest and I've got a little altimeter and my altimeter says, oh, well, I'm at, I'm at sea level, right? The altimeter is reading inflation. And so if I set the altimeter to a market basket of YouTube streaming videos and Domino's pizza and manufactured goods with a 5% variable cost, I pretend that I'm at sea level, but I keep marching the Boy Scouts up 5,000 feet and at 5,000 feet, they can't breathe, but we're at sea level. And then I march them up to 10,000 feet and now they're all freezing cold. But I say, no, it can't be, we're at sea level. And I keep marching them up. And eventually I march the Boy Scouts to 20,000 feet and they're all froze to death. And, and at some point you got to say to yourself, uh, maybe the altimeter's wrong. <laughs> maybe the, the instrumentation is wrong. That, and that's that's the dilemma I think you have. A lot of people in business don't recognize that that there is um, um, a bleeding of energy. They don't they don't recognize the fact that energy is is draining out of the currency at the rate of monetary expansion. They can't even agree on what the rate of monetary expansion is, and, and that it's a profound thing because if it's one or two percent inflation, there's no urgency to do anything. But if it's 15% loss of energy, then you're sitting on a melting ice cube. But it's, it's worse than that. It's like, Dan, it's like, uh, it's, you know, if, if I'm a company and I have billions of dollars of cash and I'm pretending there's no problem, it's kind of like you have a bunch of kids and someone comes into your home and they turn down the temperature in the kid's room by 10 degrees each year. And you can either stay in your home and in the third or the fourth year, your kids are living in 40 degree temperature. <laughs> or you can actually get a new house and you can take a risk and you can move to a new home in a place that you've never lived before where the sun is shining where someone's not continually cranking the temperature down. At some point, you know, you got to decide, is it, are you more afraid of moving than you are of staying? And I guess it, it, it depends upon whether you actually are paying attention to the children. And, and how did you, you know, I find you, uh, you're such a stark contrast to a lot of executives out there who haven't realized that the temperature in the room is dropping. They're fine with the couple degrees a year, they don't notice but you see kind of farther out on that horizon. Um, you know, what sort of experience did you have? Because you were one of the longest running tech CEOs, right, of MicroStrategy. I think, you know, over the years, there's been ebbs and flows of different tech companies and ebbs and flows of CEOs who have run them. And so seeing a business last that long, you've kind of seen what sticks around, like what, what leads to permanence. W with Bitcoin, what do you see there that leads you to see this before everyone else? Was it... Uh, you know, for example, I think you have a background in the sciences, right? Like you studied aeronautics. You know, did, was it in these analogies that you come up with are very like physics based? I, what enabled you to see this future? Well, I mean, I think a lot of people aren't as sensitive to this as me. So I get that, right? All, all, there are a lot of CEOs that, that either just aren't aware of this or are focused on something else. So um, that's not surprising. Everybody's got a different degree of sensitivity, right? I mean, I... I could say I'm more sensitive than them, but you could say I'm a lot less sensitive than you, right? <laughs> like uh, I wasn't so sensitive as Satoshi, right? I totally get what Satoshi was talking about 10 years ago, but I'm 10 years late. So what, why, why do you get it? Well, I, I think you have to get to some stage in your life where, where something happens that causes you to notice it and then your circumstances, right, are, are of, of a sort. So 
if you live in Argentina and you had a business right now, or if you were living in Lebanon or Turkey with a business right now with cash in Lira or in the Argentine peso right now, then I think you would probably be quite sensitive to it. <laughs> like uh, you would see it. Um, you know, so I, I can't claim, uh, I can't claim I have those kind of circumstances. Those are, are pretty visceral nor can I claim that I was particularly visionary because I think all the OGs, right? All the maximalists that have been in the business for a decade, they're much more visionary than me. I think I would just observe that I was maybe just in the right place at the right time, right? I mean, 2020 is a year. It, it's a paradigm shifting year, you know? There's, we declare a war on COVID. We declare a war on the currency, a COVID war, a currency war, two wars. What Thomas Kuhn says is, is in the structure of scientific revolutions, paradigm shifts get rejected by the old guard and by the old generation until they're dead. There's a, you know, generally you got to wait till people die. You know, they have a hard time accepting new paradigms, whatever they might be, but there's only one exception, right? One exception is in wars, people will adopt a new paradigm. Right. So normally you would expect Generation X will figure out Bitcoin because they're a different generation. And you would expect that Warren Buffett will never figure out Bitcoin. Right. Uh, just like Warren Buffett really didn't even, he didn't figure out Apple either. It was it was it was someone 40 years younger than Warren Buffett working for Warren Buffett with the discretion to make the investment that made more money for Warren Buffett than Warren ever made in his entire life on any decision he ever made. Right. And by the way, the guys that bought Apple for Warren Buffett with that discretion made Warren Buffett more money in like two years than Warren Buffett made in 70 years. And Warren might not even noticed that he made the money and they made the money buying into Apple's mobile network eight years into a 10 year run. I mean, so talk about late. Right. I mean, they I mean, they missed the first 20 years of the Apple story from 98 to 2018. They picked up the last two years. They still got it. So and not just Apple, the Buffett lost out on almost every he didn't really invest at all into tech. You know, I think Apple was his first foray into it. But yeah, he largely missed the tech. tech boom. So people don't get that. But on the other hand, why do you actually adopt a new paradigm? Uh, a war, you know, you want to get someone who's a you know, generation Xer you know, or, or whatever to adopt a millennial idea. Well, people used to say to me, oh, Bitcoin is this cool thing. I'm like, well, I, I don't get it. But I, I know I've got Apple and Amazon and Facebook and Google and they're working for me. I get that. So, and I know I got other headaches and I'm not, you know, and I got a bunch of money. So I guess that's good. So that's, that was like noise, right? This, this Bitcoin thing is noise. And then, then people would say, well, you know, there's like, there's, there's the Fed is printing money. Well, that's kind of noise too, because it's not that big a deal. And then people would say, well, you know, remote work, remote work is really the future. There's this, you know, thing called Zoom. What is, I, you know, I use other stuff. I, I use WebEx and, or Skype, but I, you know, it doesn't quite work that well for me. I've had a hard time with it. And so, no, I think you should come into the office. So when we got to February of this year, I was like, kind of oblivious to the Fed. Money is good. Office is good. Don't know about these newfangled video conferencing things. And Bitcoin, I, I forgot I ever had an opinion on it. Honestly, that's February. March, lockdowns. Now you, you know, now you can't travel. Now you can't have an event. Now you can't go give a speech. Now you can't get on an airplane, whether you wanted to or not. Now you have to meet with everybody remotely. Okay. So, okay. We try it. We try it with WebEx. Oh, it doesn't work that well. Then we try it with Skype. Oh, that doesn't work so well. Then we try it with Slack. That doesn't work so well. By the way, these tries, these tries are every hour. Okay. <laughs> Monday morning, day of the lockdown, 9 a.m. Try to have a meeting with WebEx. My microphone cuts the sound drops. Uh, try to have a meeting with Skype. Now, try to have a meeting with uh, Slack with 12 people on the line. Well, eight of them come through and four get dropped and the bandwidth is not working. You know, the CEO goes ballistic, the IT people scramble. You know, we've got this new thing called Zoom. You might want to try. Okay, well, give it to me. 2 p.m., the meeting works. 
By 5 p.m., an email goes out to the entire company. <clears throat> Zoom is a new corporate standard. We will buy it for everybody. Everybody will, will use it. By the next week, there's a Zoom 100 course. Everybody in the company has mastered Zoom. How long, how long did we dabble with video conferencing? 10 years. We screwed around with video conferencing before March of 2020. Did the CEO embrace it? Did the company embrace it? Did I get it? Not really. I mean, did we use it? Yeah, uh, tactically. Maybe we, we used it 3% of the time. And then hard over, we flipped in four weeks to using it with a thousand times the intensity. That, that's what a war will do for you. And I think that we, th that war, which was just a jolt to our operations, our P&L, like the way we see the world, that created another jolt to the way we saw the balance sheet. Because once we realized that we weren't going to travel, we couldn't travel, all of our marketing events weren't going to happen, those things we used to do, labor and capital and burning fuel, that's not the way we're going to do it. Um, by the way, we have 1,100 people on this call right now. You know what it cost me to put 1,000 of my customers into a room last year? $2 million. Okay. Wow. We used to spend a million dollars or $2 million to do what I'm doing with you. It's going to cost me an hour and a nickel. Okay. Now, so, so we went to a different world. And when we realized that our operation got jolted, all of a sudden our P&L got jolted. Now we realize, well, you know, we're, we're never going to be able to throw money at something ever again. Like, like if you're going to compete in the enterprise software business uh, against Microsoft and SAP and Oracle, we're not going to outspend them. I'm not going to throw bodies at the problem ever again. The only way that you're going to, you're going to appeal to their customers or you're going to do business is have a cooler, better mousetrap. And that means you got to say something interesting or intelligent or give somebody something interesting and intelligent. So we flip from using people and using capital and using money to drive sales and marketing to using talent, intellect, and then, you know, YouTube and streaming video and channels and cyberspace. What happens next is the Fed all of a sudden, you know, Wall Street doesn't, Main Street doesn't recover. Main Street gets locked down. Wall Street has a V-shaped recovery. And you have a K-shaped overall recovery, right? That's the K-shaped recovery. If you're looking at the business, you could see that was going to happen by mid-April. You know, by mid-March, it's two weeks to stop the spread. By mid-April, it's pretty clear it's not going to be two weeks to stop the spread. And it's pretty clear there's going to be a K-shaped recovery. People are not going to be back at Disneyland on airplanes by the end of April. That's very clear to everybody except for people on TV that don't want to say it, right? So once you can figure that out, you realize, oh, we have cash. We're going to have cash flow. We have all this money on our balance sheet. And by the way, it looks like assets just got 20% more expensive, but in dollar terms, but I just can't see how there's any company or, or the broad portfolio of companies, their cash flows didn't just accrete by 20%. The underlying fundamentals of Wall Street didn't get 20 or 30% better in the four weeks after March, but the stock market did. And so you saw delamination of asset values from the underlying fundamentals. And that's the aha moment when you realize that the currency is broken. And at that point, that kicks me into a new way of thinking because I'm just living it. And I'm realizing simultaneously that money is not ever going to be useful to me. I, I mean, that, that $500 million, if I'm holding that for a rainy day, I'm not going to be able to spend $500 million to grow my revenues. If I, if I bought 500 million worth of, by the way, one experience I've had, Dan, I've spent $25 million on Facebook advertising and Google advertising. You know what it got me? Squat, nothing. I've blown $20 million and I got zero from it. You know, like I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, you know, I, I could, the amount of money you can spend on digital marketing is obscene. I've, you know, so I've spent lots of money hiring people. 
I've spent lots of money running events. I spent lots of money running digital campaigns. And what I realized is the money's not going to help us. And it's and if we do generate 50 million a year in cash flow, and if the monetary supply expands by 10%, I'll lose the same 50 million in purchasing power that I'm going to get in cash flow. And I end up with the same conundrum that every wage earner has, which is just you're losing purchasing power as fast as you're as you're making it. And so what are you going to do about that? And, and as a CEO, you're constantly trying to navigate your ship, your company through these waters, right? And so this catalyst moment arrives, shakes your fundamental understanding of like, how are we going to do sales? How are we going to go sell our product? And then at the same time, you have that, that catalyst moment, that, that go to war moment where it changes how you think about your money and how you allocate this treasury. Um, you're probably one of the fastest A to Z <laughs> from zero to Bitcoin maximalist <laughs> individual I've met. You know, back, it, it took me years to get to where I am. And it's amazing to see you kind of go through this transformation, through this catalyst moment. What future catalyst moments do you see where we'll see, you know, large swaths of like 10 or 20% of the population get into Bitcoin? What, what moments would you hypothesize where we'll see a bigger kind of wave come in? Well, I mean, Dan, I had a lot of advantages you didn't have, right? I mean, I had, I, I got to come ex post facto, right? I mean, time is a stressor. So, for example, you didn't exist before you had to make your decision. Like, I got to watch you, right? It's path dependent. So, Dan Held was part of my decision. The fork wars and Bitcoin Cash and the result that was part of my decision. The entry, uh, you know, the spinning up, uh, the success of Coinbase after many years, the success, the entry of Fidelity, you know, uh, all of the the bullish case for Bitcoin, all of these things, and the fact that they were still working were part of my decision. So, so we're all path dependent, you know, and and you didn't have, um, it's, it's like I said, I said to someone once, it's like, if you're um. If you go to a, a, a sunny resort, a luxury resort in the Caribbean, and someone walks out with scuba equipment, and they and you're sitting on the beach reading your favorite book, and it's balmy, and then some people are playing in the swimming pool, and the scuba instructor says, hey, you want to try this new scuba equipment? You might think it's kind of a luxury or elective you know, thing that you may or may not want to play with. Now, if I pick you up in a helicopter and drop you into the lagoon, with a weight around your leg and you go down 37 feet in the water. And then I drop the scuba tank with the regulator down next to you. And I think, say, you might want to check this out. And it's no longer a luxury. It's no longer elective. You think you would take so long getting to the conclusion that you want to learn how to scuba dive. I mean, it's a different situation, right? Do you have the luxury? Is it elective? Are you getting there in, or in, um, in, a, in a normal environment? Is there a slow boil or is it a crisis? So I, th I think that the crisis quickens the resolve, just like if I drop you 30 feet below the Caribbean Ocean, I don't think you're going to sit and debate about the risks of, of like putting a regulator in your mouth. Well, I, I've never done that before. Like what? Yeah, what? I never. I haven't checked the oxygen, right? There's a million reasons why you might want to try the crypto scuba tank. Like I never done that before. That's strange. I'm not putting that in my mouth. You know, what if I breathe wrong? What if someone? Did, what if the oxygen runs out? What if it makes me happy or laugh? What if someone dosed it with nitrogen? There's all these concerns you have that are academic when you're on the seashore, and they're not academic. They're matter of life or death. I'm below. So I think that that's what. Go, drove me here. Now, looking forward at, at Catalyst, um, look, I, I think that um, each, uh, each uh, public announcement, each public commitment is one more Catalyst to the next. So, so um, you know, I made my announcement corporately, the first one, and that got some people's attention. They said, well, I mean, that's something. Well, first, first announcement, by the way, you can see this on Twitter. MicroStrategy said, we're considering Bitcoin and silver and gold and stocks and bonds. And 
I love the Bitcoiners. I love crypto Twitter because you know what happened when we put that out there? Every investor in the world ignored it, except some Bitcoiner <laughs> found it and they posted, MicroStrategies considered Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I was, I'm reading, I'm like, whoa, man, talk about confident in their beliefs. It's like MicroStrategy is considering Bitcoin. They pull that out and they started blasting that. That was news. A week later, we announced we bought 250 million. That was another news. A month later, but, but, but then it was like, oh, MicroStrategy's got an investment. Is it, you know, are they, is it a speculation? Order? Then a month later, Oh yeah, we bought a lot more. In fact, by a month later, 90% of our, our discretionary cash was in Bitcoin. It's, and that's, people are trying to get their heads around that. And then a bit after that, you know, we, we saw the move by Square and Jack bought us 50 million and that was great. And then we saw Stone Ridge and I think that was great. You know, where Raw, and by the way, Raw said, you know, it's in our treasury. And then he said, you know, the U.S. dollar is, you know, is weakening against Bitcoin 70% over the past two years. And that causes someone to stop and think, okay, well, legitimate, sophisticated institutional money managers are thinking about the world differently. You know, and the Paul Tudor Jones thing was thinking about the world differently. I think you're going to see over the next 12 months, you're going to see waves of more announcement, announcements. Well, we, for example, we saw PayPal, big announcement. Square is, Square is uh, what, 30 million person mobile bank. PayPal is 300 million user mobile bank. <clears throat> I think as you see tech companies build Bitcoin into their offering, those are catalysts, massive catalysts. As you see, institu you're going to see institutional money managers build Bitcoin into their offering. You know, first it was Fidelity saying you could buy it. But when Fidelity says, well, we've got a Bitcoin fund, you can just wire us $20 million and that'll give you direct exposure to Bitcoin. That'll be, that, that's a good thing. And they're talking about it and I read the, the press on it, but you know, uh, mutual funds and, and, and investment funds, I think that'll be big. I think that um, when you start to hear institutional investors come out and say, we bought it, right? We bought it. We're going to buy more of it. We bought a lot of it. You know, what happens if Bill Ackman says, I bought a billion dollars of it? Right. By the way, he hasn't. But, but by, what, let's go back to Paul Tudor Jones. Paul said, oh, I think I, I, I'm putting 1% into it. All the Bitcoiners like took a victory lap. This is great. Like, uh, and then, then he says, oh, I put 2% into it. Okay, well, that's great. Well, my view is like, he, he's still not serious yet. Right. Like, I, I mean, it was nice. It was, it was nice, but, but it's a little bit patronizing. I mean, like, to be honest with you, like, okay, you're an investor, and you're telling me that you, you know, you kind of understand what I'm doing and you're going to put 1% of your portfolio into it because it's kind of an interesting hedge. You don't really understand what I'm doing. You're, I mean, it's, 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 it's kind of patronizing in a way. If you really understood and you're an investor, you would say, oh, we made an allocation of X. We put 500 million into it. Okay. We got a $10 billion fund. Well, how important, if you really got it, if you, if you thought, well, all my bonds and equities are, have fiat underpinnings and they're decaying at 10% a year or a more, then you would say, I, you know, a good hedge would be I put 10, 20, 30, 40% into it. But let's, let's not go there because they do whatever they're going to do. But I, I'm amused because I think everybody thinks these hedge fund guys know how to make money. If they really knew how to make money, they would put a billion into it and then they would get out on the wire and they would say, I bought a billion dollars worth of it. I'm going to buy more. And, you know, and if they were really smart, they would go to the three guys they play tennis with in the Hamptons. Cause I know these guys, I've been to the tennis tournament. I've seen it. And each one of them would buy 500 million each. And then they would just successively say, I bought 500 million for my fund. He bought 500 million for his fund. The next week, someone else buys 500 million. 
by the time four of them have bought 500 million, bang, 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 the FOMO kicks in like there is no tomorrow. You remember when Bill Ackman got on television during the crisis and he basically groveled and you know, explained how the world was coming to an end while he was shorting the stock market? He shorted the entire stock market. He said the world was going to come to an end. The market traded down. He covered his bet. He made $2 billion and then he bragged about it. That was on like a $50 million bet too. It was some crazy asymmetrical return. And Yeah. So, I mean, my point is these guys do this for a living, right? I mean, this is what they do. You know, if you've got a billion dollars and you put all of it in Bitcoin, it's commitment, it's conviction. When you've got $10 billion and you put 500 million into Bitcoin, you know, it's just a day's work. I mean, that that was the idea this month. I mean, Ray Dalio's of the world. That's just kind of what you would do just to entertain yourself, you know, or George Soros if they got interested. So I think that the guys that move next, they're, that have the easiest possible decision-making process, the least to lose, the most to gain, are guys that are just running huge amounts of fast money in these hedge funds that are just looking for their next idea. Totally. There's a, there's a couple of things here that I thought were really interesting. One is you, you touch on career risk, you know, folks jumping in and buying Bitcoin, whether you're a fund manager or a CEO, as more and more of you like yourself and Jack legitimize the space, then it, it reduces that career risk for more people to get in. Um, it, it's less, it's less crazy. And I think, you know, it, it is a little frustrating though know, for us mega bulls because we're both hugely bullish about Bitcoin. We've put a large portion of our net worth into it. It's hard for us to look at these other people who have, and you, I think you were kind of right. It's a little patronizing with Paul Tudor Jones going, oh, I'll put it in a few percent. You're like, well, do you believe in it or not? Because if you understood the value prop, you'd be all in. It's an it, ignorant it, statement, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> to, say, to, to say I'm a great financial investor, I'm a, you know, I'm a master of the universe. I understand macroeconomics and investment, and I'm therefore allocating 1%. It's, it's silly. So, uh, so I, it's amusing. But on the other hand, you're going to see other people that are going to take a harder position. I, th- I think there are people that are taking a much stronger position in Bitcoin now. They're just not public about it, right? I mean, when I actually came out, you know, when I, when I came out and said MicroStrategy did it, well, I had to, right? It's, it's just a requirement. We're a publicly traded company, no choice. But when I actually uh, announced my own purchase, I didn't have to. And there are people that would say don't, right? And, and by the way, for 99.9% of the Bitcoiners, I would say don't. I get it. People would even post on their Twitter, why'd you do that? You know, first rule of Bitcoin, don't tell people how much Bitcoin you have. I'm like... <laughs> That's true for 50 million people, but we need 10 people that we need to have 10 people that will say, I bought it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm going to buy more. And you can too. In fact, not only can you, you probably should. You might want to get some in case it catches on. So at the point that I do it, if Jack Dorsey does it, if Mark Zuckerberg does it, if Jeff Bezos does it, if some random billionaire playing tennis in the Hamptons does it, if a Bill Ackman does it, when a Paul Tudor Jones does it, if Paul Tudor Jones really wants to do something good for his position in Bitcoin, there could be no more accretive thing he could possibly do than to be honest and say, I bought 400 million of it and I'm gonna buy more. It's like, if you're not willing to say that, you're just patronizing and insulting the rest of us, right? I mean, that's, that's my view on that. If you're not going to say that, it's like, uh, so I, I think it's going to happen, right? Pete, there is some bravery, some courage here. By the way, I own courage.com, right? <laughs> I'm not going to, I know that I'm going to path it to Bitcoin, although I could, but you know, you there's a difference between buying $250 million worth of Facebook and buying $250 million worth of Apple and buying $250 million worth of sovereign debt or gold. These things are traditional, conventional asset classes that everybody understands. 
if you were to stand up and say, oh, I bought 250 million worth of Facebook, that's somewhere between vain, you know, and flashy and arrogant or whatever. But when you're, when you're birthing an asset class, when you're actually legitimizing a brand new idea that 99% of the world doesn't understand and they, they are either ignorant of or afraid of, at that point, it's important that people with conviction stand up and they say, nothing to be ashamed of. I did it. I'm proud I did it. I'm going to buy more. It wasn't a hedge. It's not a speculation. You know, I, I didn't show up, you know, Dan, to sleep with your daughter for the night in a one night stand. I want to marry your daughter. Like, what? you know, I kind of feel like, you know, it's like, I don't want a one night stand. I don't, you know, I actually want someone to make a commitment right. to me. That's the difference here. And so we need companies to make commitments. That's why it's brave for Square to step up and do it. That's why it's brave and courageous for PayPal to do it. That's why I applaud what NIDIG did and what Stone Ridge did. And I think more people need to do it. And uh, if I have to uh, take a bit of flack and take a bit of heat for being public, somebody's got to do it. Totally. And, and I think you framed this perfectly. The first article I ever wrote was hodlers are the revolutionaries. We're in a war, this, this war moment occurs and you need someone courageous to stand up. You need someone who's willing to sacrifice reputation because they know what's true. They know, they know what they believe in is right. And that's, that's what we all do well. The hodlers, the Bitcoiners, we're part of keeping that flame alive. As your analogy used earlier, we're the keepers of the flame. Um, and we, we represent something very important because this isn't just a revolution to, to innovate X, Y, Z in a technology sector. This isn't a revolution to increase our human rights on one area. This is a, money is the most fundamental component of all human life. It is the storage of all time and energy that we spent to earn it. So th this is, I think hodlers, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what role Bitcoiners and hodlers play. But the, I think they're, they're part of this revolutionary guard to keep Bitcoin alive. And they're the reason why Bitcoin is alive today. Yeah, so my thought on this, um, in the world of financial assets and economics, you have a $250 trillion world and, and scarcity is a rare and odd and strange idea. Right, because all assets are bleeding energy. Fiat is being printed. People are issuing more bonds. Companies are issuing more equity. Right, people are developing more real estate. Miners are mining more gold. All of those assets are inflating, and therefore, they can't hold energy very well, unless, right. And let's say a, a company's got to grow its cash flows faster than the rate of monetary expansion. Other and and uh, if they're if they're not able to do that, then they bleed energy and they and they're not a good store of value. So on one hand, you have this world where, which is the world of the economist, where politics and philosophy enter in, and and the idea is because I believe something, it's okay to go ahead and print a trillion dollars right? There's a different world, <clears throat> the world of engineering, which I grew up in at MIT. Okay. And, and it's bizarre to me. Bit, Bitcoin is unique. It's the only scarce asset. It's the only one where you can't print more of it. And that makes it utterly unique in the finance world, but it's utterly ordinary in the engineering world. There isn't any engineering system that doesn't, uh, that doesn't uh, respect the laws of thermodynamics and conservation of energy. The, in fact, the entire universe operates, I mean, under natural law. And the first law is conservation of energy. You can't make it or you can't get rid of it. it you can convert it between mass and energy, but it is what it is. And Einstein knew it, Newton knew it. If I build a pneumatic system with a leak in it, it doesn't work. If I build a hydraulic system 
with a leak in it, it doesn't work. If I have a power line with a leak in it, with a short, it doesn't work. If I build an airplane with a leak in it, we all freeze to death to blow up. It doesn't work. The nozzle doesn't work. The ship sinks. The building collapses. The bridge shakes itself apart. If you don't recognize conservation of energy, which is by the way, what's the ultimate scarcity, right? Scarcity is energy. It's all energy, right? What is money? Money is monetary energy. Money is, money is a word used so often that people don't really think about what it is. But if they're an engineer, you would say money is monetary energy. Monetary energy is the superset of all energies relative to the human condition. Kinetic energy, potential energy, chemical energy, nuclear energy, electrical energy, all energies can be converted via work into money. And money can be, I can take your $100 million, buy a bunch of guys with guns and start a war. That's kinetic energy. I can take the $100 million, buy electricity. I can take it and I can buy whatever I want to buy. I can climb up the mountain and get potential energy. So money is energy. Bitcoin is the first software network in the history of the world that, can, that is capable of storing and channeling monetary energy without power loss. Fiat is a monetary energy system, and there are different systems. The Argentine peso is a monetary energy system that's bleeding 20% a year. The US dollar was bleeding 50 basis points a month for the past decade, but now it's bleeding 1% to 2% a month. If I, you know, every system, gold is a, is a monetary energy system, it bleeds 3% a year and occasionally it crashes, right? And um, so what I think is we created via crypto technology, via this decentralized crypto network, we created um, a system which will store, which will take analog energy, you know, and, and people, people focus upon the power, but really any analog energy I take that energy, I encrypt it, I put it into a block of encrypted energy, which we call a Bitcoin, which you generated by a combination of hash rate and then, and then the private keys that we use to, to protect that block of encrypted energy. I put that onto the blockchain, where, which is no different than vacuum, vacuum sealing food. You know, If I'm a food company, I vacuum seal the food to store the food energy. That's the basis of Heinz and Kraft and every food company. And Marjorie Merriweather Post got rich and famous because she figured out how to stabilize food energy at room temperature for years at a time. Um, in fact, she bought, I think it was Bird's Eye, which is the first frozen food company. When people figured out how to store food energy without spoilage, then it became, she became the richest woman in the world. And so when, once you understand all of these exercises, John D. Rockefeller was capturing chemical energy, you know, and Post and Kraft were capturing food energy. And what, what we're doing is capturing monetary energy on a network. Then you realize to convert analog energy or, or convert energy that, it, it, that is wasting away into an encrypted form that will last forever is, uh, is an incredible achievement. It's like getting out of the gravity well, right? It's, it's like I got into space, I'm in a vacuum. Now I can rotate at 25,000 miles an hour around the earth forever and I'll never stop, right? It's like if I put something in a vacuum, it will last forever. It's not gonna decay. It's not gonna be attacked by bacteria, et cetera. If I leave it on the ground, it's going to rot. And so what's going on here with the hodlers is, and I, I said this, I said, you know, in a world where everybody, you know, is dissipating energy, you know, preserving your energy is the winning strategy. Everybody's dissipating it. And by the way, they might be dissipating it by holding it in dollars. They might be dissipating it by trading all the time, right? Trading is dissipating energy. All of this, buy it and sell it and move it around and convert it. Uh, all of the running around is dissipating energy. The winning strategy is stop 
dissipating energy because everybody else is dissipating energy so fast. If I have $100 million sitting in cash, I'm dissipating at 15% a year doing nothing. Just flipping it to Bitcoin and doing nothing means that in 10 years, the cash goes to zero and I've still got $100 million worth of energy, right? If everybody else, if 99% of the society takes the other trade, in 10 years, you'll own everything, which is what Bitcoiners understand. And so, and I, I see all that, you know, there's two people, sets of people in the world. There's everybody in crypto Twitter, and they're all running around, like making all these snarky comments, like Bitcoin cash is 20 times faster transaction rate than Bitcoin, which is so freaking foolish, silly, stupid statement to make. And I won't say who tweeted it at me because you can probably guess who tweeted it at me. It's such a stupid thing to say because you're, look, you're living in a pond with $25 billion of assets, which nobody gives a crap about. And on the other side of the pond is $250 trillion worth of assets. And PayPal has $250 billion market cap and 340 million people. And they're going to scale up the transaction rate of Bitcoin by a factor of a billion, right? PayPal is going to move transactions a million times faster than the blockchain. And they're going to do it for free for us. And anybody that wants to move transactions fast in and out of their wallet will use Square Cash or PayPal. And those two will FOMO Apple Pay and Android and Google Pay, and eventually they'll FOMO and you know Amazon into providing the payment rails. And, and they're going to create sexy, beautiful payment rails that run a billion times faster than a proof of work blockchain, that w- which is Bitcoin. And the hodlers will be sitting there with their encrypted energy, with their life force hodling. Everybody else in the world, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, PayPal, Square, they're going to be desperately working to do all that transactional stuff. And if you want privacy, Monero and Zcash are going to solve the privacy problem. And if you want to do DeFi or whatever, someone will work on the DeFi problem. Maybe it'll work and maybe it won't work and it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, if you have a million dollars worth of monetary energy, chasing, taking it and, and risking it. I, I give you a million dollars of monetary energy and you could expect that if the money supply expands by 15% a year, you're going to get a 15% real yield on it. If the technology that, that uh, PayPal and Square and Apple and Amazon and Google bring online or Binance or Coinbase or whatever, that the technology they bring online increases utility, you'll get another plus 10%. When everybody understands that this is happening, they're going, to, they're going to stampede through a very tight nozzle in order to convert their, their analog fiat-based bonds and, and stocks and, and their gold, which is debasing. They're going to convert that monetary energy off of those assets into Bitcoin. You'll get another 10 20%. Right. What happened in the past 12 months is what the thing is up. Bitcoin's up 80 percent, something like that. You can explain it as one part inflation, one part adoption, one part technical utility in the near term. And in the long term, if you look out 100 years or whenever, maybe 30 years, at that point, when everybody's adopted, if it is the standard or if it's a substantial standard, then you would expect that the value of just hodling would increase with the productivity growth of the economy. For example, the reason the gold standard worked, even though gold miners are printing 2% more gold a year, is because for 100 years, the economy of the world grew 2% a year. So if the economy is growing at 2% and if the, if the amount of gold is growing at 2%, your claim on the economy is constant. If the economy stops growing, your claim on the economy dilutes by 2% a year and then you're, <clears throat> you're bleeding energy at 2% or 3% a year, absent counterparty risk, right? And with Bitcoin, you know, the, <clears throat> if I'm a hodler, I would say, I put my money into Bitcoin. 
I'm going to get the yield of, of the monetary expansion in the fiat frame of reference I live, right? This is not, if you're in Argentina, it's a pretty good obvious yield you're going to get, right? If the peso crashes by 25% a year, you're going to get a much bigger benefit in pesos. If you're in the US and you're down 10%, you'll get a different benefit in Turkey or in Lebanon or whatever. You're going to get that benefit then everybody's going to get the technology benefit from PayPal and the like. Then you're going to get the adoption benefit as, as people like me stampede in. It's like, you know, I paid whatever, $9,800 a Bitcoin, a lot more than most hodlers paid. I, was, I wasn't thinking if I sit around, maybe it'll go back to 4,000. I was thinking... I'm a rational person reacting to rational circumstances. What if other rational people with more money than me have the same idea I have, in which case I'm going to have to chase this thing to 20, 30, 40, 50,000. And, and hence the phrase, you know, once you understand it, you go to bed at night with chronic anxiety, with anxiety, feeling chronically short. You're like, I was worried the rest of the world would start acting rational. <laughs> right. And so in that, I was happy to be able to buy it below 10,000. I was like, this is a gift. Thank you. I'm not, I, I'm not anybody that's that all the people that think they know Bitcoin that sit around and they whine that they're, you know, I, or they lament, I got to wait till it goes back again. I'm going to wait for it to crash. It's, I, I think they don't really understand Bitcoin because if they understood Bitcoin, then they would be thinking, the only thing I worry about is how do I figure out how to buy more? <laughs> like, <laughs> like that's the only thing I'm thinking about. How do I get some more of this stuff? I'm not thinking, I'm not trying to be cute, right? I'm not trying to trade it. I mean, it, it, it's, if you thought that you're going to get those kind of returns, then you're really looking out to when it's worth a hundred thousand or when it's worth a million a coin. And then you're saying, what's the consequences if I didn't buy one? Yeah, you don't care if your cost basis is 10% cheaper, you know, because you're you're looking at 100x, 10x sort of appreciation. You don't care if you got it a little bit cheaper. You you want in because you see this future. And, and my point here is you can buy it, hodl it, put it in cold storage, not touch it. You don't need yield on it. You don't need to do all sorts of complicated things with it. You don't need to trade it. You just you're you're preserving energy in a world where everybody else, where 99.9% of the money is dissipating energy. Right? So if if you're the 0.1% that is preserving energy when 99.9% .9 of the asset holders are dissipating energy, that's enough. That's a pretty wise thing. And everybody thinks you need to do something with it. You know, they just don't understand it. I mean, I, you know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They just don't understand. First of all, crypto networks are not going to defeat Apple Pay and PayPal and Square Cash as a payment rail. They're not, it's not going to happen. There might be a small, a small little, uh, a, a small niche business in privacy that may or may not get shut down by a government. <laughs> but may or may not, and it may or may not work. But the point is, you know, a billion people are not using a crypto network as a payment rail, nor do they need to. And it's not, by the way, it's not clear that you need a crypto network to do, to do uh, banking or trading. You know, DeFi, is it going to work? I, yeah, maybe, maybe it's going to get shut down by the regulators. It's, it's going to get hacked. It's going to have the wheels fall off. It's going to be a attack vector for all sorts of people. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll not work. It's a speculative thing. But is it necessary? No, it's not necessary. Binance doesn't have to do doesn't have to do DeFi to run an exchange. Coinbase doesn't need to be a decentralized exchange. Yeah, you know, the the billion people in the world that are having the the monetary energy sucked out of their room. They don't give a crap whether they bought it on a decentralized exchange. If I go to somebody in Argentina and I say, look, I'll save all your money and you won't lose your stuff, right? They're gonna say, great. Now, the only caveat to that, I suppose, is if you live in a government or you live in a country where, where the country has literally outlawed 
the exchange, the on-ramp, right? So if in fact, uh, if in fact a, uh, an African nation has made it illegal for you to buy Bitcoin and there is no centralized corporate operator of Bitcoin, then yeah, then I get it that some kind of decentralized exchange might be interesting to you. I'm not going to get into all the regulatory issues because they're all different and, and there's a different circumstance. What I'm going to say is <clears throat> in the developed world, you know, between in Europe and, and most of the developed Asia in the US, there's billions of people and all of their, all of their needs can be met via crypto banks <clears throat> that plug into the blockchain and PayPal Square, Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, you're all just crypto banks and you're going to compete with each other right, to, to see who's going to provide the best mix of services, the best, uh, the best performance, the best experience. And when your security fails, the banks need to get taken down. And when, the perf when, the, you know, when you charge me 9% for a loan and someone else charges me 3% for a loan, I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to go to the 3%. But then when someone pays a, you know, offers a 3% loan and they take too much risk and they go belly up and they get wiped out, I'm going to go back to the 9% loan, right? And so there's going to be a competitive marketplace with all of the banks on the blockchain. And, it's, and there's going to be some areas, like people complain, PayPal doesn't like let you take your Bitcoin, you know, into cold storage or take it on your own personal device and self-custody. Okay, yeah, but that's not a problem. That's an opportunity, right? I mean, what instead of complaining that they don't let you, you ought to say, oh, they're offering a simple mobile solution and they don't have this feature. That means that I can start a business or stay in business by offering said feature. Totally. Right? And, and, and so there's a lot of people that aren't going to buy Bitcoin through them because they want the option to take physical delivery of the Bitcoin. Right. And that's but, an opportunity for companies like Kraken. If on the other hand, if, if Kraken... If Kraken is in the business, you're much better off to have PayPal come in and sell a hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin in their walled garden, because those hundred billion dollars worth of Bitcoin people are going to discover Bitcoin, like it, and they're not—they're not stupid. I mean, that's the marketplace. If in fact people want to self custody, or if they want, you know, your mixture of uh, of financial services or your trading pairs or whatever you offer, then they're going to migrate to you. And by the way, even if they don't, the beauty of Bitcoin is if I'm a hodler in Alabama and I bought one Bitcoin and I put it in cold storage and I don't touch it for a decade. And if, uh, if an exchange spins up in Singapore and it's got totally different regulations and they can let you trade futures and options and pairs and currencies against swaps and the interest rate curve and short Amazon stock and a market basket of this and that and the other things. And it's utterly, totally illegal in the US to do that thing. A pool of $50 billion of capital, if it works, will go to Singapore. They will do that thing in Singapore. <clears throat> they will drive the, drive the price of Bitcoin up by a factor of 10 because of something they're doing at the edge of the network and then the Bitcoin that the hodler has in Alabama, they haven't touched in a decade that they barely remember they have, just went up by a factor of 10. You, you, you have a massively decentralized <clears throat> economy. It's an economy in cyberspace. Anybody can, enjoy, can join. It's permissionless. And, and it grows with the highest common denominator, not the lowest common denominator. And so the beauty is, is anybody in another jurisdiction may be able to do something you can't do. You don't got to chase it. You don't, you don't have to change your citizenship, move to Singapore and learn how to day trade options, swaps, swaptions in order to get the yield. You can be a hodler and sit and do nothing because there's only 21 million Bitcoin and the demand for Bitcoin is going to increase at the edge of the network where someone else comes up with that complicated idea. So it's 
let the professionals juggle the razor blades and let them juggle the fire. And if they drop all the fire and burn themselves to death, somebody else will pick the thing up and they'll juggle it until they realize it doesn't make sense and people will stop juggling it. Or maybe it will make sense. And maybe this DeFi thing is like a million billion times better than NASDAQ. And that's good too. Let's just wait and figure it out because everybody's got the right to take every risk they want to take as long as they don't inflict that on somebody else. And that's, that's what I think about Bitcoin and what I think about hodlers and, and what I think about all the people that criticize it. Every piece of functionality, transaction speed and scalability that people critique Bitcoin for not having is going to be delivered by, by the crypto banks at the edge of the network. <clears throat> And the right way to think about Bitcoin, I think, Dan, is Bitcoin is the central bank of cyberspace. It's the central bank, except it's the fair central bank that respects the, the laws of thermodynamics and the conservation of energy, and it's never going to screw you. And there's no one that's ever going to change the rules on you. And now, now you've set up that central bank and that underlying base layer. Does anybody really think that, you know, Bitcoin, Satoshi, Vision, Cash, you know, something next is going to outdo Apple Computer and getting close to the customer. I mean, how are you going to build into Face ID? How are you going to, you think you're going to outdo Amazon? You think you're going to outdo Google or outdo Twitter or outdo, you know, PayPal? You know, the thing that you should admire about Jack Dorsey is that Square Cash or Square is extraordinarily successful. And, and they are ex successful with Square Cash in the face of competition from PayPal, 10 times bigger than them, while Apple owns the iOS, while Google owns Android, and while Amazon owns every truck roll <laughs> and every warehouse. And yet Square Cash is still rising. And, and that's kind of a David and Goliath story. It's an amazing story. So, you know, Jack Dorsey with his 5 billion in cash and 90 billion in market cap and his infinite number of engineers is going to fight that battle. It's kind of silly to be telling people that are working on, you know, Bitcoin core to do something to address that issue. You don't have to do anything or to, to end this with a statement. Don't just do something. Stand there. <laughs> exactly. And and Michael, I, I got to come out and ask the question. We've only got about 10 minutes left. And I got to ask you the question. At, at what point, what, what price of Bitcoin do you think we can declare Bitcoin victorious over other stores of value? So will Bitcoin, will we have kind of declared victory when Bitcoin hits 100,000 or a million or 10 million? Where, where do you see that? Like, that, what's the key? Look, I, I think that the, that the, the, the milestones, the flippenings where you can actually have a celebration are, you know, at, at the trillion dollar point, you've, you've flippened a Facebook or, or uh, uh, one of the big tech companies, a Facebook or, or a, a Google or the like. At two trillion, you'll have flippened an Apple or an Amazon, right? So the big tech, small tech or mega tech flippenings are the next two points that you can celebrate. Then I think at 10 trillion, you'll have, uh, you know, there's two, there's two asset classes I look at every day. One is gold, about 10 trillion in gold. And I look at the, the volatility and, uh, and, and the performance of gold. And the second I look at is the NASDAQ index, which is about $10 tr trillion worth of stuff in it. I mean, half of it's big tech and half of it is everything else. And so I think at 10 trillion, you you basically flip in uh, big tech as a group and you flip into gold, you know, and I, I think at a hundred trillion, you've, uh, you've flipped uh, sovereign debt as a safe haven asset. Yeah. Right. And I mean, and each of those are milestones uh, to shoot for, you know, and, and we'll see how it goes, but, uh, but I would be, I would be focused upon each of those levels. We're still so early. I think, you know, often people look at the unit amount. They look at, oh, it's $13,000 per Bitcoin, but they forget that you, when you multiply that by 21 million, that the market cap isn't very high. 
Um, you know, it's kind of like Berkshire Hathaway. A share of Berkshire Hathaway is, what is it, $300,000, $400,000 a share? But that doesn't tell you anything until you multiply it by the numbers of shares outstanding. Yeah. I mean, too often, I've said this before, the crypto community is like, <clears throat> Uh, there's a lot of non-constructive people. I think 99% of the people get it, but 1% in crypto Twitter, I, you just got to ignore them because they're non-constructive. They're just looking for ways to fail, why why nothing will work for anything. Or or like you've got a $250 billion success and they're wanting to start all over again. You know, <laughs> I, I think... I mean, there's no point in that because Bitcoin's really the only legitimate crypto asset that has any chance this decade of actually of actually replacing these these legitimate traditional assets as a store of value and so what what we ought to do is just focus sorry we always look at bitcoin versus facebook i mean the real question is you know do you feel more comfortable holding bitcoin than amazon or bitcoin than facebook or Bit, you know i look at big my thing is look at bitcoin versus the nasdaq index you know, the, you know, the NASDAQ index was ahead of Bitcoin, the price for a while, and it just crossed over. You know, I think NASDAQ peaked to 12,000 and it, it traded between 10,000 and 12,000 and Bitcoin was like 9,000 to 12,000 and then it flipped and Bitcoin blew through 12,000 and, you know, through 13,000 and NASDAQ went, you know, headed back down again. But you know, I think that if people just look at that and they're like, well, how do I feel about this as a store of value versus equities as a store of value? That's the question. And every metric and every debate we ought to have is, is Bitcoin going to hold uh, energy, monetary energy better than gold? Or is it going to hold it better than big tech? Because those are the only, I mean, those are the next two logical targets, right? People are either going to buy Bitcoin because they like the big tech proposition, but Bitcoin, you know, looks like a better store of value, a better safe haven or a better upside. It's an earlier stage monetary uh, uh, digital software network. That's one, that's one constituency. We should go get those people, right? Uh, or we should go get the gold bugs, another constituency. Those are the only two constituencies worth debating with and pursuing I, I don't think we're going to convert people that are holding, you know, sovereign debt into Bitcoin this year. But I do think that uh, that we can convert big tech investors and we can convert gold investors with the right story and the right message. It's definitely an arc of multiple decades of adoption. It's going to be waves of different types of folks who come in and, and start to understand and and really grok why Bitcoin matters. Uh, with the last five minutes here, I do want to ask one more question, which is around, and I think this is a really interesting take because I'm not sure if anyone else covered this in your other, other podcasts. Do you think your experience with buying and selling domain names, do you think that gave you insight into digital scarcity? So when you found Bitcoin in the 21 million Bitcoin hard cap, do you think it was easier to understand because you had had that previous experience? <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Look, look dot com, dot com is the is the main chain of uh, of domains, you know, and and 80, 90 percent of all of the uh, search energy and all of the all of the economic energy in cyberspace is on the dot com domain, Google dot com, Facebook dot com, Apple dot com, Twitter dot com. When you go type something in, it's 95 percent likely you typed in a dot com and um uh, and English, by the way, is a dominant language. So I, I would say fundamentally, my appreciation of digital scarcity just comes from my appreciation of uh, math and physics and engineering. Again, the ultimate scarce thing is energy, time, energy, you know, time, mass, energy, the, the universe, right? So this is conservation of energy as scarcity the universe works with immutable laws. You break the law of gravity, you die. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that. There's no, there's no appeal. You don't get to screw around with it. You don't get to suspend it. Right. And this is the, this is the case. So if you study engineering, aeronautical engineering is a really good discipline because to be an aeronautical engineer, you have to master structures and thermodynamics and propulsion and electronics and avionics and, and uh, fluid dynamics and the like, and it's every single discipline. And if you break any of the rules, the plane crashes, everybody dies. 
So, so, so a non-negotiable thing, <laughs> Reynolds number, adiabatic lapse. This is just speed of sound. What happens when you break the speed of sound, right? Big problems, speed of light, big problems. They're, they're immutable scarcities that define the universe, gravitation. So I think that that, that that understanding helped. I think that when the domains came along, that, that was just a, an observation. I, I think there's a certain gravitational, uh, an appreciation of gravity uh, and the laws of gravity, which are important. Like we've talked about Metcalfe's law and network effect, but Metcalfe's law falls down in one area. Metcalfe's law says that, you know, the power of the network is like, you know, proportion of the square of the nodes. But it doesn't it doesn't address the fact that it's all, that the 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 gravity or or the the gravitational power of a mass is a function of the density, <laughs> the density of the nodes. So what Bitcoin is is it's an economy and it's a network in cyberspace with a bunch of nodes. As the nodes increase, yeah, that's important. But if one of those nodes is Mark Zuckerberg, and he puts $10 billion on one of those nodes, that node is more important than the other nodes, right? These are not all created equal. When 10 billionaires show up with a billion each, and they decide they want to put their billion on one of the 10 wallet addresses, those 10 addresses are going to be a lot more important. And so what people have used the phrase black hole, it, uh, to describe Bitcoin, it's relevant because what's going on is it's sucking in monetary energy. The more energy it brings to the network, the more gravitational pull of the network. There's a liquidity effect. And I, I'm not quite sure if there's a law for this, but eBay saw it. I mean, every financial market sees this. When eBay got uh, liquidity, when all the buyers came together with all the sellers and there was a bunch of inventory then all of a sudden uh, the entire world collapsed into eBay and it became a screaming success. And with any market maker, it's the same thing. You have to create, you have to pull this liquidity and liquidity can be measured, has to be measured as energy, right? Social energy, monetary energy, you know, material. eBay was like material energy, product energy. Amazon is a certain uh, product energy. So as you, as you pull the energy on the network, the gravitational pull uh, toward other potential participants increases, it starts to collapse into, a, into its own tight thing faster and faster with more, uh, with more appeal. And look, you, you can conceptualize a universe where there are multiple gravitational bodies, right? There's the earth and the moon and the sun, <laughs> So you can have different networks. There's going to be the Apple network and the Amazon network and the Bitcoin network, and they're going to find some orbits around each other. But as one network gets stronger, it changes the trajectory of the orbit of the other body, right? Like Facebook and Netflix are having their orbit deflected by Apple's policies on their Apple store, and Google is deflecting Apple's organ or orbit. And Bitcoin is going to deflect some orbits. And as it attracts more monetary energy, it'll deflect more orbits and it will grow. I think the only, the only other important point here, though, is and some, some mathematician, I'm sure one of the cyber hornets will come up with the mathematical formula, which is a Metcalfe's law dollar weighted, right? Or a monetary energy weighted Metcalfe's law. That's what we want to describe the growth of the Bitcoin network. Once you understand that, though, you realize that when I joined Facebook, it would take me a long time to pull all my social energy on the Facebook network. I mean, how long will it be before I, I posted a thousand things on Facebook? It'll, it'll be a while. When I joined Bitcoin, how long will it be before I put all my monetary energy on the network? That could happen fast, right? Like with me, that could happen fast, <laughs> How long will it be before you buy everything you're going to buy on the Amazon network? That's going to take you a lifetime. How long will it be before you store everything you own on the Bitcoin network? That's not going to take a lifetime. 
And so the dynamics of a monetary network and the, and the rate at which monetary energy pulls in the network could be much more uh, aggressive, right? It, 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 can, it, it can, it should come much faster. I mean, th than many of these other software networks that, ha that were pooling a li liquidity, right? Because like you give me an eBay network and I'm gonna trade on it a uh, thousand times over 30 years. It takes me 30 years to get the full value proposition. You give me a stock trading network and, and, you know, and I'm going to trade on that for 10 years. It takes me 10 years to get the full value proposition. You give me a hodling network. You give me a savings and loan network. I, put all my, I crack my piggy bank. I put all my money into the savings and loan network. It's going to take me like one week to get the full value for the rest of my life of that network. And you're wow. Saying that, that, that mass, right. that, that giant mass is so big that the, when, when other, when all this other value gets close to it, it starts to get sucked in. And that, that process happens much faster than these other, other pieces, these other uh, bodies that are with their gravitational pull are much weaker than this huge mass of, of a savings and loan bank at the end of the universe. When, when a $10 billion institution decides to take a, a, a small position, it'll be a $500 million flow in a week. How much, how much, how many of them need to do that? 10,000. How many of them can do that? 10, <laughs> 10 before it becomes very noticeable. Right. So, so one in a thousand. So like, look, we don't have to convince everybody. All we got to do is convince anybody. And I think anybody's already convinced. It's just a question of at what rate do people move and we will see. And that's where the price is a signal. As the price goes up, people become more aware of it, which are then drawn into anticipation of the price going higher. You described earlier the FOMO that you had. All we have to rely on, I think it's a really beautiful mechanism that Satoshi built with a 21 million hard cap. There's no supply response when demand increases. So the price goes very high that high price draws an awareness and it completes the cycle. The, the engineering uh, term for it, which I, I studied at MIT, I studied system dynamics and it's all about, um, it's all about nonlinear systems, right? The, and the dynamic is positive feedback loop. It's the basics of servo mechanisms and control theory. It's a positive feedback loop. <laughs> so the, these things are all unique and, and innovative and extraordinary in the economic and the finance world, there's nothing unique and extraordinary about them in the engineering world. Because Dan, you know why? Because nothing works in engineering that didn't do this. If you don't, if you don't build homeostatic processes and feedback and, and respect the laws of conservation of energy, and if you allow any of your electrical energy or hydraulic energy to bleed out of the system, it just doesn't work. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky, the air conditioner doesn't work. And if you're unlucky, the, uh, the factory explodes and the plane crashes and burns and everybody dies. But one way or the other, every engineer that ever lived knows the laws of scarcity, that knows the importance of, of thinking through the feedback loops, right? You ever see the bridge at Ver Verisano Narrows Bridge? It's a very famous video. They show every engineering student. You know, the engineers built a bridge and they got the harmonic frequencies or the, the natural harmonics uh, aligned and they accidentally aligned the harmonics of the bridge with uh, the natural frequency of the wind over the, over the um, river. And the bridge shook itself apart and literally self-destructed once they cut the ribbon. And... They, they, they're like saying, don't mess with mother nature. You don't just get to make stuff up. You have to actually submit yourself to the laws of physics. And, and if I were to extrapolate and even take your statement and, and take it a little bit further, I would say that economics wasn't based on science before Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the first time that economics became a science. B Bitcoin is a software network engineered to serve, to host a safe haven asset you know it's it's an engineered monetary energy network 
so that you can store and channel energy without power loss. It's the first one. It's the first successful one. I mean, people tried it before, I guess. It's the first successful one. If you define success as capturing $100 billion worth of monetary energy in it. And in that regard, it's a thing of beauty, but it's an engineering breakthrough, just like a nuclear reactor, just like a space shuttle, right? Just like an aeroplane. It's an engineering, just like a railroad, you know? Did it cost a lot of money to build the first one? Yes. Did it actually cut the cost of moving stuff around by a factor of a thousand or a million? Yes. Is it a revolutionary network? Yes. Well, people, did people understand it when it first hit? Most didn't. Will they eventually? I think so. And, and Michael, you, you've got this deep fascination with physics, mechanics, uh, mining, and industrial sort of mindset. And by, by the way, Michael, I know we're a little over time. So if you need to go, let me know. I know you're a busy guy. I'm good for a few more minutes. Awesome. Awesome. Have you ever thought about uh, you know, doing anything Bitcoin mining related? We had a few people ask questions around that. If you are at all personally interested. Um, you know, I think everybody in the economy has got to decide <clears throat> where they, they want to focus their energies. And if you're going to, if you, Bitcoin is an economy, it's a cyber economy. Once upon a time, you know, America was this great capitalist nation, land of the free and capitalist and everybody, everybody doing business in the quest for the almighty, worshiping the almighty dollar, right? That's America, the Warren Buffett America, right? Well, Bitcoin is every, uh, an economy in cyberspace, everybody creating their own business in worship of the almighty Bitcoin. Okay, so the difference being at least Bitcoin is a conservative energy and the dollar is, it has got a leak in it, right? Um, so having said that, you have to decide where in the economy want, you want to be. You can be an investor. You can be a trader, right? Uh, you can be uh, an, an, an analyst, an advisor. People are giving good advice. Um, you can be an exchange. You can be a bank. You can issue loans. You can sell volatility. You can buy volatility. You can do futures, right? I mean, these are all things you can do. You can build mobile apps like PayPal and Square are doing, plugged into <laughs> plugged into it, right? They're leveraging their assets. Um, MicroStrategy is an enterprise intelligence company. What we're good at is extracting insights from raw data. So what you can figure is we run a node, we extract the entire blockchain from the node. When I'm thinking about what we're going to do, I'm thinking we should extract that entire blockchain, turn it into a microstrategy data set, start to build hyper intelligence and business intelligence on top of the blockchain and give the world some tools that they can use to create their own custom intelligence in that Bitcoin ecosystem. And if I take the 100 million lines of code and the 30 years of experience that we've got in business intelligence, where I'm quite sure we're the best in the world at that, and I tack on the Bitcoin blockchain data set, and then I put the two together, I'm going to deliver billions of dollars of software value to the Bitcoin cyber economy that people that are interested in that are going to use, right? So that, that's me bringing my assets in an overwhelming way to the network, right? If, if I can't take $10 billion worth of software and adapt it to Bitcoin, it's not likely that I'm gonna take a hundred million in capital and be the world's best miner. So if we go to mining, I, I think mining makes sense if you have an edge in, in electricity. Like a, the fundamental issue is um, mining is, is, is like three things, right? It's, do I understand uh, electricity and can I get it? And can I hold it for the next decade? And, I, and can I get it at a, a rate that's more competitive by way, and this is a brutal observation. I have to get electricity at a rate that's more competitive than the cheapest electricity producer on earth at any given, at every given time, which means I have to actually ask the question, is it possible the Chinese government will give away the, the electricity for free or will the Iranians or will the Russians give away electricity for free so that they can actually 
grab the Bitcoin or monetize that hardware or something or create jobs. You know, you can dump electricity on the market. So that's the first question. The second question is, can I actually get an edge in the, in the, uh, the SHA-256 ASICs? Right, because it's encrypted energy, right? I, you know, if I just put the energy out there, that's analog. But if, I, if I'm gonna run a hash curtain, I'm gonna have to have hardware, okay? So can I get an edge there? And the third is, do I know how to operate a data center? And can I manage, <clears throat> manage all of the business operations? So there are three different things. And if, if I owned a bunch of energy and I had nothing else to do with it, then I'm a strategic low cost provider. <clears throat> but for me to go onto the spot market and buy energy on the spot market and buy ASICs on the spot market and then learn to do it, it's like, I, you know, I'm the newbie, but I don't have any particular advantage in this space. If I, you know, Dan, if I had $100 million worth of capital, I could go and I could set up a mining operation and then I could buy energy and then I could worry about whether my energy provider is going to screw me and triple the price. And I could worry about whether the Chinese or the Indian government will give it away for free. And I could worry about whether the ASICs will be out of date. And then I could worry about the price of Bitcoin. But I could just take the hundred million and buy Bitcoin and stop <laughs> worrying. Because let me tell you what the risk is. The risk if you buy Bitcoin is the price goes down or the price goes up. If the price goes down, it was a mistake. If the price goes up, it was brilliant. On the other end, take the $100 million and, and set up a Bitcoin miner. Well, the energy might cause you, Bitcoin might go up and you don't get any <laughs> because your, your hardware is not competitive. Bitcoin might go up and you don't get any because your electricity is not competitive. Bitcoin might go up and you don't get any because it takes you 10 years to get it. Bitcoin might go up and you don't get it because you screw up your data center. Bitcoin might go up and you don't get it because the politicians change the law regarding mining and tax it. There's a lot of ways that you don't make any money or you, or you lose, even though Bitcoin goes up if you're a miner. Whereas, and if Bitcoin goes down and you did everything perfectly as a miner, you still lose. And uh, one more point, and I'm sorry if I'm beating this to death, but if I put a hundred million into Bitcoin, I could, I could sell volatility against it and generate a yield if I wanted to, or I could borrow against it if I wanted to. If I put 100 million into SHA-256 hash powers and next to some hydroelectric dam somewhere, I can't borrow against it and I can't sell the volatility. And so if you look at it from that point of view, the bottom line is you need an edge in totally. the ecosystem. And, every, and by, that's just... Apple, you know, PayPal should do what they did. They have an edge in consumer wallet on a mobile device. They shouldn't be in the business of giving people cold storage with 24 seed keys. And that's not their business. They shouldn't do that, right? They should do what they can do, right? And, and Apple, when they do Apple Pay, they should just put in a, Apple Pay, buy some Bitcoin, you know, done, simple, Everybody should play their position. That, that's the whole beauty of a cyber economy. Don't you think there's going to be 100,000 business models and 100,000 businesses, and some are going to work and some are not going to work. And by the way, the most brilliant, beautiful, perfect mining rig, you have like free electricity and you have the world's best ASICs. And one guy gets elected governor and he outlaws mining in your jurisdiction and you lost it all. Like, we don't, that, the definition of anti-fragile, right? Is it like, not we don't expect stuff to break. We expect it to break. When it breaks, you know, the mining shifts somewhere else. And that's why we love the thing. And so there are some people, they have no choice. If I'm sitting in the middle of China and I have no other way to make money and I'm next to a hydro dam, and if there's no use of the energy whatsoever, and the only thing in the universe I can do is mine Bitcoin, sounds like a pretty good idea to them. And, and I really like how you put it where there's, you know, when you hodl Bitcoin, there's no operational risk. I don't have to worry about the miners not turning on. Maybe, maybe the electricity goes out overnight or I get my equipment stolen or there's a flaw. With hodling Bitcoin, you just 
move it to cold storage and hobble. There's no operational risk. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's no doubt that for the normal person, the mere mortal, they should buy as much Bitcoin as they can, as they think they can afford to buy and not run out of money. You should buy Bitcoin as a as a long term savings account. If you need the money to live on in the next six months, you keep it in a cash checking account, and Bitcoin's like a treasury for a rainy day. <clears throat> And you hold it and you don't screw around with it. Like, like screwing around with it, chasing after them. If, if I thought I was going to get a 40% yield, then risking it all to get 4% more. Like, and by the way, that, that's for a normal person. Let's take a big corporation. It's not that different. If I have 500 million in Bitcoin, should I risk it all in order to make a 5% yield? Like, the reason I got it is because I thought I was going to get much more than that by hodling it, right? And the, the problem with, uh, with you know, trying to generate yield is also the tax code is very hostile. So like you go and you make all these trades and if you lose, you lose all your, you know, if the trades are losing trade, you lose it all. And if the trades are winning trade, you have to pay 40% of the win to the government or 50%. If you're in California, I'm not going to ask you what it is in California. I don't know why people could even live in California right now, like at the rate that these taxes are going to. But I mean, you're going to take, you're going to risk all your money. And if you win, you're going to give half of it to New York or California. And if you lose, you're going to lose it all. And, and, or you could have done nothing, taken no risk. And if Bitcoin trades up by 20%, there's no tax. And if it trades up by 100%, there's no tax. And if it trades up by whatever, there's no tax because there's not going to be a tax until you actually sell it. And of course, the logical thing to do if you're an investor is you hold it forever. And then eventually, if you need cash, you borrow against it. I'm not talking like 80% margin loans borrow against it. I'm saying that when you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you borrow 50,000 against it or 25,000 against it. And when you have 10 million worth of Bitcoin, you borrowed 200,000 against it or 400,000. And as long as you've got a loan to value that's south of 20%, even the, even the most onerous Bitcoiners are like, well, you might get an 80% drawdown. Right. Okay, well, don't borrow more than 20% against it and you'll be ready for the 80% drawdown. And that's where, yeah, in the future, we're going to see Bitcoin as a collateral. Bitcoin's a phenomenal collateral to borrow against because it's liquid, it's fungible. It's not like a property which is not fungible, not liquid. In the future, we're probably going to see the dollar, you know, the dollar interest rate that you pay on a Bitcoin collateralized loan be very low. Because the opportunities for like Kraken are going to be, you know, you form a bank, you're, you're holding custody, you either extend people loans you know, or you give them a chance, you give them a account that might give them yield, or you might give them loans, or you just give them the loan, right? The market will determine what people want. And, and of course, you know, I, if you said, I'll give you a loan to value of 20%, and the interest rate is 4%, I might like that better than a loan to value of 80%, and the interest rate is 8%, right? So depending upon what kind of loan and how much risk. And, you know, maybe if I said, you know, if you want the money overnight, it's going to be 5%. But if you want to lock in the loan for a year, it's going to be four. And if you want to take a loan for a decade, a mortgage is three. And, you know, and, and how that works out, there's a lot of competition between the various banks and providers. The market will have an opinion different people have different sources of funds and cost of funds. And, and, um, and uh, I look forward to seeing the entire Bitcoin cyber economy grow, right? It's a lot of work to be done. I mean, you got to work through the regulatory issues and you got to work through the risk issues, you're going to work through the execution issues. And, and uh, that's what keeps it exciting. But my advice to anybody looking to be in this business <laughs> or make investments is figure out what your assets are. And figure out what your talent is, you know. And you know, instead of like complaining and bitching and moaning that PayPal doesn't give custody, do it yourself, right? Like, right? Everything that you think is really critical that isn't being met by some other entity, 
If it's really that important, you ought to be able to go do it yourself and start your own company. And if nobody wants to buy from you, maybe it wasn't that important after all. And you'll find out, welcome to the world of the marketplace where, where you've got your ideas and the market's got it idea, its ideas. You have to have humility and stoicism. One thing I'm sure of though, is when you're stretching beyond your fingertips, trying to do everything, trying to be all things to all people, when you think that you can, you can do a hundred... It's the arrogance and the presumption of the young engineer. They're like, we're going to put 100 features into the product. And we're going to, it's going to be the fastest, strongest, bestest, most beautiful thing. And everybody else sucks. And they sit there like, well, PayPal sucks and Square Cash sucks. And all these other guys suck. And Bitcoin sucks because my blockchain is better. And I've got a million other things. It's, you just don't know what you don't know, right? The only reason you haven't failed yet is because you haven't rolled it out yet. And so as soon as you do it, and then you realize that it breaks and it's fragile and has attack vectors and it gets hacked and it's too slow and it's a dog and people can't run it on their device and no, and you spend a million years and you built the best thing ever. And then PayPal's got a hundred million people to use something with 1% of your features. Then you're going to realize that there are other things that are, that are more important in the market than just having a lot of ideas or having the best plan. It's, it's all about that product market fit or that protocol market fit. It's a classic product mindset that a lot of these engineers, I feel like they don't really have that. They, they build a shiny thing and then they go look for a problem to solve. But it, it starts the other way around. There's a problem that you solve with a solution instead of find, having a solution chase a problem. Well, I mean, I know we're running out of time, Dan, but I think it's worthwhile to make this one point. Like, I'm not here to fix Bitcoin. I'm not the newbie that came here to fix Bitcoin. I like Bitcoin the way it is. In fact, in fact, I love Bitcoin the way it is. And um, the way it's currently constructed, it is possible to put all $250 trillion of monetary energy in big blocks of encrypted energy on the blockchain <laughs> Maybe the Bitcoin will be a million, you can probably calculate $10 million of Bitcoin or something. Big blocks, $100 million chunks on the blockchain. It'll store all the monetary energy in the world and it should store it for the next 100 years without losing any of it. Isn't that enough? I mean, isn't that enough? Do you really need something more I'm telling you, you can save all the monetary energy on the planet forever. Isn't that enough functionality for now? Everything else you want, you can get off chain from Kraken, from Square, from PayPal, from Binance, from Coinbase, from Nidig, from Grayscale. There's plenty of people that will plug the gap of the rest. The blockchain does what it does. We should protect it. We should secure it. There's, there's small, you know, small incremental changes. We should move forward very carefully, extremely carefully. And the fact that people are extremely careful, it's a good thing because if Bitcoin is going to fail, it's not going to fail due to lack of functionality or lack of speed or lack of scalability, Dan. In my opinion, if Bitcoin is going to fail, it's going to fail because of it loses trust and security. It's a robustness issue. We have to protect the network integrity at all cost. It's going to fail for one of two reasons. A, some engineer with a good idea, a really insanely good idea, introduces an unknown unknown into the network and it breaks. I, I, my, all my failures, Dan, I, I've had a lot of successes, a lot of failures. We could spend two hours talking about the success and the failures, another podcast. But let me tell you, I never failed because I pursued a bad idea. All my failures were insanely good ideas that everybody around me agreed was a good idea that didn't work, right? No bad ideas. No one pursues bad ideas. So if, it, if Bitcoin fails, it'll be because an engineer had a good idea and we got too enthusiastic about it and, and they break it. Or it'll fail because the maximalists lose faith. You know, it's 
the technology is good enough. Now it's about the religion. If you think that you're going to put your money, your life force into this and give it to your son's son or your granddaughter or your grandson, or you're going to endow your park and your neighborhood for a hundred years, or you're going to use it to save the world, or you're going to use it to live happily ever after. As long as you believe that, as long as you love something on this earth and Bitcoin is the, is the vehicle for which to power that with your monetary energy, then it'll live. And when the maximalists lose their conviction, that's when you start to worry. So beyond that, all of the complications should be solved by a bank, uh, not the central bank. They should be solved by an entrepreneurial company that's going to take the risk and get the reward. If they do it right, they should win. And if they fail, they'll lose their capital. That's capitalism. That's Darwinism. That's the law of nature. <laughs> that's the law of physics. That's the universe. Michael, I think this is, you know, we could go on for probably another three hours and a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> I think if they let us loose, we could probably go all day. I, I think that's a phenomenal spot to end. We unfortunately only have two minutes left. So we have to kind of close it off here. I think that was a phenomenal ending wrapping up with Bitcoin lives as long as we keep believing in it, as long as the hodlers keep believing. I think that was super powerful. Um, so Michael, really appreciate you coming on. I had a blast talking with you for two hours. You know, if we want to have this again, I'm totally open to that as well. I, uh, you know, like I said, we could probably have a bottle of whiskey and, and talk about this for a long time. So again, thank you so much for coming on. And if you've got one last statement you'd like to make, happy to give you these uh, last two minutes over to you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> My last statement is like, don't mess with the Hornets, man. <laughs> Gotta get a Team Hornets shirt. Don't mess with the, 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 the hot the, the hodlers will inherit the earth. They're my people. That's perfect, Michael. Well, thanks again for hopping on. And uh, and everyone who watched, appreciate you sticking with us for two hours. I had a blast. And uh, hopefully we have Michael back on again soon. Thanks, Dan.